Well, hi everyone. Thank you very much for watching or listening today. Liam Hartree here with another episode of Presenting Champions. And today I have a very, very special guest, truly uh, inspiring man, um, a prestigious boxing talent as well, uh, currently a coach and trainer. Today's guest is Neville Brown, former British middleweight boxing champion between 1993 and 1998 with five defenses, also challenged for the European title twice. Uh, challenged for the Commonwealth title and challenged for the WBO Super Middleweight World title as well against Irish boxing legend Steve Collins. Uh, in addition to this, I should also mention that Neville also won two uh, ABA titles as an amateur before his pro career. He was in there with some of the best of the best uh, of his era, currently a trainer and coach, um, as well as the creator of smart to box and the Neville Brown philosophy, which we will be touching on um, a little bit later because he's doing some fantastic work there. So I will just say to, uh, to all boxing fans, stay tuned and uh, Champ, obviously a big thank you for yourself for coming on and a big thank you for making the time um, to have this talk today, by the way. I do appreciate that. Excellent, Liam. Yeah, lovely. If I can, it's good to talk, I always say. So is BT, doesn't it? <laughs> but yeah, it's good to talk. So yeah, yeah, you fire away, my friend. Um, I hope I can uh, oblige. Absolutely, absolutely. So. I think, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, I'm going to go through the different phases of your life, you know, from past to present to future. So one of the things that you've talked about that I think is a good place to start is um, your beginnings, uh, the beginnings of your boxing journey. You've spoken very openly um, about growing up as a, a mixed race individual and the fact that that was really the uh, beginning, the, the formation of your desire to box, your desire to compete, make a name for yourself and, and everything that came next. So I'd like to go back back in time now, a, a little while, you know, a few years, to, to talk about those early years and to talk about some of those experiences that shaped you uh, into the champion that you would, you would soon become. So uh, let's start there, please. Yeah, right. How, young, how far do you want to go back? My mum said I came out running. <laughs> <laughs> So well, I was always moving, yeah. So I was always on the move. Um, if you can imagine, um, I had a natural, loving childhood. Uh, dad and mum were together till I was 10. My dad is Jamaican born, came over here in the uh, seven, or early 60s. Um, and my mum was a British born lady. Um, you can imagine the times were hard for mixed race couples to come together. So I would never known about that as a child um, as I went to school and came away from the house I started to realize I was different otherwise I'd, I had a great childhood and, and, and disciplined and a lot of love so um, I suppose in some ways I was very sporty very active on the move um, schools I enjoyed I was a friendly kid wasn't a troublemaker I kept myself to myself um, and I was a bit of a shy kid, I suppose. My mum said that my name was Noddy. I never said, why did, why did you keep calling me Noddy? Because when I was really young, I never said nothing. I just would nod my head. <laughs> if they asked me if I wanted some, I'd just go. And that, you know. so, so when I came into the boxing world, um, I was still this shy kid. But all of a sudden, the world came after me. So my first fight, for example, I, when I took up boxing, uh, was against a champion, Staffordshire champion. And all of a sudden, beating him and stopping him in my first fight, and he was 18 fights as a Polish lad. I'm pronouncing his, ring, his name wrong, but it's Polowski. So, his, so he was like um, um, a Polish lad, he lives in America now here. And uh, he was 18 fights, two losses, and couldn't get fights. And for some reason, I ended up in the ring with him. And I ended up stopping him. And all of a sudden, I hit the paper. And so this little shy kid, I was now having adults, um, all types, stopping me in the street and saying, Neville, proud of you, putting Burton on the map, well done. I was like, uh, okay. I had no idea. I was just, boxing just threw me from day one into the front. Now going back, as a child, I was, uh, like I said, I was very fit. I, was, I thought I was Spider-Man, so I was always climbing up walls and everywhere and getting cuffed by my mum, behave yourself, just walk down the street normal. Why you got to jump onto walls every two seconds but I loved movement and um and I think I was drawn towards that more because my mother my mother being British wasn't she couldn't really read and my dad couldn't really read so I never had that I never had that sit down and read a book philosophy sit on the lap and go 
high. And it wasn't until I was about six or seven that a, a teacher by the name of Miss Tyson, she was a youngish teacher at the time. Um, I've, been, I've been wanting to find her. And she, at infant school, she basically said to me, um, or junior school, she said to me, Neville, you're not as daft as you make out to be. So I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> and she said to me, right, we're going to spend a couple of uh, breaks teaching you how to read. And Miss Tyson spent time with me, had some great teachers along the way. And Miss Tyson was a teacher who, who just took time with me. And she read books to me. And within three months, I'd caught up with the rest of the class. And I remember the first book I was reading, it was Simbad, and it was a Simbad uh, book, about six pages, if that. And it was like, the first thing was a picture, and it was like words along the line of Simbad was now going out to sea. And she'd ask me, what did it say? And I couldn't, I just looked at the words and I was a bit shy. I could kind of make out the words. And I don't know if I used from dyslexia, I didn't know. But because I'd never had that upbringing and that upstart in reading or whatever, a lot of love, a lot of attention, a lot of discipline. Miss Tyson would read it and I'd copy her. And that's how, I'm, and I realized then I was good at recording stuff. So if someone showed me a move or showed me something, I could imitate it. Sometimes, even with the boxing, they'll say to me, do Prince Nazim, do Frank Bruno, and I can imitate their styles. Yeah? Even to the extent if someone says do a dance move, I can very quickly learn it. When I was younger, I could anyway. And I, saw, I knew I was good in them directions. I was good at drawing, I was good at art, I was creative, so I'm a Piscean born. So school was brilliant for me, but I never really took off in the, in, in the theory side of things. I never took off on the side. I was more of a sporty person. I was doing judo very young, athletics very young. I was breaking records, so I got all the attention. So clearly, another teacher, Mr. Bell, said, I think you're going to be going far in sport. Um, which one? I don't know. And it's boxing that took off. Uh, in, well, boxing kind of took off because I kind of felt like I could make a living from this. Even though I didn't understand professional boxing or amateur boxing, I couldn't tell the difference until someone told me, yeah, they don't wear a shirt. <laughs> At 12 years of age, that was the difference. That's all I knew. Yeah. So amazing. It's amazing to go back to the beginnings and you know how it started and you know some of these experiences that shaped you. It's uh, it's wonderful to get an insight into that. Um, obviously you had your your amateur successes as well, as I mentioned, winning two ABA titles. How did you feel at that time, you know, when, when boxing began to sort of take off for you, you started to win, uh, you know, your first tournaments and you started to actually realize, you know, I'm, I'm good at this. Um, let's talk a little bit about that time. I, I suppose it was a crazy time because up until that point, I'd never really shined. Um, mm -hmm. You don't realize when I say shined, as a sportsman, I shined. Three-legged race, sports days at school, I would win. I'd be, I'd be the Carl Thompson or Carl Lewis of the day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I was winning anything. I put my hands, jumping-wise, running-wise, done. So, judo I was doing well with. Athletics I was doing well with. I represented uh, well, England in the athletics in, um, in a long jump and triple jump. But I suppose the boxing was the one. Um, and I think the fact I met some great mentors um, with the sporting world. I had lovely father figures. My dad was around, even though my mom and dad split, but I still had that essence. So the, the boxing, well, it was a strange phenomenon. I mean, I, I joined the gym and it's sad because the person that got me to go to the gym is a young, is even younger than me. His name's Tim, Tim Foster. And I'm going to his funeral this week. And it's sad that he, Actually, it was kind of him that said, come down to the boxing gym. So I joined it with him. And we both started boxing. And three or four months later, um, they finished and I stayed. <laughs> and I'd made a connection with a coach called Mickey Lynch, who became like a father figure to me, to everybody, really. A bit like the Brendan Ingalls of, of, of later years. And um, um, he saw something in me and he said, it took me a year to get registered and he, he installed in me a, a habit that he said to me, do you want this? And I went, 
the youngster, 12, 13, uh, want what? <laughs> he says, do you want to box? And I was like, mm, yeah. No idea what boxing's about, but yeah. And he says, uh, I think you could go somewhere. So he, he put trust in me straight away and he watched how I trained. He didn't have to monitor me. In fact, he had to slow me down. And he monitored, he monitored everything I do, which is what I do with a thing called Smart to Box today. The intelligence is I want a kid to come there and I'm going to inspire him through art of movement, boxing, whatever. So he was doing this. He was watching, making sure I didn't overtrain. So with this man homing my skills and doing the thinking for me, I was able to take up with boxing. And like I said, in my first fight, I beat the Staffordshire champion. I think I had 90 amateur fights and I think I lost 15. And to be honest, I think I only lost four ever. There's some bad decisions in this game of boxing and I didn't realize amateur and pro, there's not much difference between the both. It, it really seems sad that they destroy the sport. They do, in my, in my own honest opinion. Um, because the, the sport itself is beautiful. Um, but yeah, so I, I fell in love with boxing and, and this, these father figures, they took me through the championships and winning the championships was just like, my first championships in Derbyshire, I think I was crying when I was in the final. <laughs> I was thinking, what am I doing here? I'm, it's my seventh fight and I'm in the finals. Boxing a guy called John Bromley, I believe, a London lad. And I totally froze for the first round. I didn't know what to do. And it wasn't till about 10 seconds into the first round that he caught me with a right hand and it woke me up. But up until then, I was looking at my coach and going, what am I doing here? <laughs> and, he, and he went, what do you mean, what are you doing here? I goes, what am I, you've earned the right to be here. You beat all those fighters to get here. You, and I was like, I was just had no belief whatsoever why I'm here. And I looked at this guy, and he had all the badges, England, this, that. My kit didn't even fit me right. <laughs> My shorts were leaned off. You know, I'd got a big oversized uh, protector in there and, and so on. And, like, I looked scruffy. And I was like, oh my God, what am I doing here? I did not feel right. Anyway, after the first round, I sat back down and my coach went, you've got him. And I thought, what are you talking about? He goes, he thinks he can beat you. You've got him. He, he's, he's overconfident. I went, right, he goes to me, I want you to come out and throw a double jab backhand. What are we doing in the gym? Just throw that. And I came out and I threw a double jab backhand and I was a schoolboy champion. And it was like, how did you know? He goes, I saw what you could do and you could put it together. And I was now schoolboy champion. And I went on to win five national titles after that, back to back. And so, wow, I thought I'd made it in some ways. I thought now the, the leaders, if that be what they're called, the, the England coaches would now would pull me on board and I'd be part of the training camp and I'd be going to the Olympics and I'd be going to all these places. And, you know, it's not as easy a route as we think. No. No, it's still some amazing highlights there, though. So obviously some fond memories as well, which is what really comes across to me. And it's it's good to give those um, those a mention and to look back as well. Um, moving, you know, obviously for the sake of time, into the beginning of your your pro career as well. I like to talk about that because you you know from the outside looking in, really brought off to a very good start. You know, your debut was a technical knockout, I believe. There was um, quite a few knockouts through, you know, through the early part of your career and you were, you were doing very well. In those early years of, of turning pro, did you always believe, you know, that you would go on to become a champion? Were you confident enough? I mean, you mentioned just now about, you know, getting to the finals and thinking, should I be here and everything. By the time you got into the, you know, the early days of, of your pro career, were you, were you still growing into the sport or did you really feel by that time, you know, I'm going to be a champion in some form? If you get where I'm coming from, I, I very much do, and I have answers that might surprise you. Um, I felt more like a professional as an amateur. Once mm -hmm. I turned pro, what I mean by that is, as an amateur, to be uh, in my day, to be to win the ABAs, that qualified you for the Europeans and 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 um, uh, the World Games and the Olympics. That made quite a simple system. And everybody had to fight everybody. And 
So, so I knew by entering the championships on a certain date, if I win, two weeks later, I'm in the next level. And then two weeks later, and so on, until I'm in the quarters, to the semis, and to the final. So we always knew where we stood. So that was good to have. That knowledge was good. And we also knew who the ones to, to threat about. You know, you had to worry about the England number one. You had to worry about who won the ABAs last year. You got to worry about who's the new kid. So everybody knew everybody. So we, we were more professional then because we knew exactly when we were. And if you didn't turn up and want to fight me, then you lost your right for the Olympics that year. So that made sense to me. Turning professional now, because I was, I was a bit crushed by the, the way I was treated by the amateur association and having, looking back now, I look back at it and it was an experience and it wasn't, it wasn't good. And like I say, that young lad that was just dreaming of being a world champion, I was beating world-class fighters. So in my head of heads, I didn't think there was going to be any issue getting the chance to win the Olympics or getting the chance to win the world championships. And um, I had a style that could, like you say, I could, I could change. I could be a boxer or I could be a fighter or I could mix both. I could bang or I could just sit back and be patient. I had it all, it would seem in that sense. And I, I love the sport. I love the training. I love the ways, different ways of training. So turning pro, what first hit me was, you got to put bums on seats. And because I was a dangerous fighter as an amateur, I never really got to box in Burton. I think I boxed twice in all of my amateur career, which is like 10 years. So as a professional, and I signed up with Mickey Duff at the time, and I assumed that the way it is today, you, you can box in Burton on Trent and you can hit Sky. You can box in Derby and hit Sky, but in them days you had to go to Wembley you had to be in the Albert Hall. So me chasing, me trying to sell tickets and get people down to, um, imagine it, a Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening, you got to take time off work, pay £25 for a cheap ticket, go down to London. So you got to take time off work to beat the traffic. And one of the first ones on at half seven, yeah? So they've got to leave, they've got to leave work early. And then, I've got to spark somebody in two minutes and then we go home. And then you're probably home late at one o'clock in the evening. Yeah. And then you got to work the next day. So a lot of people weren't going to make that transition to, 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 to London to watch me and sell me. And then when I realized then that no one's going to, uh, no one's going to pay, put, 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 putting bombs on seats, how was I ever going to sell myself? So I'd already realized as a professional, that I was going to struggle. And obviously I'm a dangerous fighter and putting no bums on the seat. So as you look at the world today, no one's coming near you if you're a dangerous fighter and don't put bums on the seats. Mm. In a nutshell. And as an amateur, I felt I could have won more. I felt I had some decisions against me that were a bit unfair. But the fighters themselves, no. The guys I boxed or didn't box, they all talked highly of me. And I think they like that I was, they always say, why don't you complain? <laughs> I, I, and I, that was part of my shy side. I, I wouldn't complain if I, when I beat the world number one, Richter at the European Championships and the whole place ripped up in 1987. And I thought, wow, I've dropped this guy in the second round, clean, dropped him. And I ran to the neutral corner and I got counted. And I was like, how does this work? And then the second round, I did it again. I dropped him again. And then I got a count again. And at the end of the fight, I lost 4-1. And the Netherlands judge came up to me and said, I've never seen nothing like that. You, you clearly won that. Richter, the guy at box, came into the dressing room afterwards and said, Brown, Brown, winner. But I still couldn't get in my head that the TVs were watching this. So it's on record somewhere. And they let that happen. Yeah. Uh, at that time, it brought back all those, which I didn't mention today, but being a mixed race child, not fitting in, feeling like an outsider as a young child, and um, going through school and going through those difficulties and battling on the streets and then boxing took over. And then boom, um, I'm a little sensation, which is a bit, bit, wow. And then at this big level now, 
I can't break past this barrier where I, I, sh I really should have come home with the gold medal that year mm. and hopefully turn pro and that would have elevated me into the professional ranks. And, and that was crunched. And I, and, and I do understand why the England team never fought for that. That was unfair. And it wasn't just me, it was happening to a lot of people. And I was really shocked at that level. Mm. Yeah. And as you see today, it's quite crude. I think a year later, the 88 Olympics, um, Roy Jones won the gold medal, but lost it to the Korean. And everybody knows Roy Jones won. And it mm. doesn't help the, the fighters doesn't sell them you know you're given a gold medal but you know you didn't win and the whole world watched it where does that political harassment come into and what does it do for for the fighters what does it do for the game yeah that, i mean as you said earlier you know it is a beautiful sport but the, the downside of it is that it's not the sport itself but the corruption the politics the uh you know the various deals that go on behind the scenes you know and, and so many things like that and uh yeah, everything you said about the, the ticket sales as well. Um, you know, there there are some real some real downsides there in the business side of the sport for fighters and especially when people are coming into it, they're young, they're green, they don't know any better about these things and there's not you know, there's not really enough guidance, uh, I don't think that you know, there are there is some good guidance, but there's not enough, you know, to really make it clear that some of these things go on and, and you know, how people protect themselves outside of the ring as well as inside of it you know and it's uh, it's a whole other other issue that we could go into um and, and you know we won't at the moment but it's, it's very good that you've brought that up because it's it's some good advice actually for young uh, up and coming fighters watching this as well if, you know if they're just starting out but there's some pitfalls to avoid as well yeah, as the, there, there, there most definitely is yes there most definitely is mm -hmm. and I, I say we, we our sport abuses itself mm -hmm. and it's, that's how you've got to look at it because we're not bringing our best fighters to the forefront we're losing our fighters because which child wants to come into a gym? And in our time, it was cold, it was freezing. The gym's a lot better nowadays, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> but, but we were all there. We, did, we didn't have Xboxes back in our day. But the point I'm getting now is we were there. And today's children, they're not going to be there and put three weeks of training in or three months training in and get to an event. And they know that they won. And they think, do I want a life like this where I put all that effort in behind closed doors? I'm off the streets, I'm doing something with my life. I'm, I'm, and I do teach this. I'm not better than you. I talk to the kids, win or lose, you're not better than anybody else. But on that day, in that time, in that moment, you were able to influence whoever, the judges, the interviewer, whoever, to say that I am the one who comes in, in the fight game. I made the better choices in that three minutes of action to warrant the decision. Well, mm -hmm. how do you explain to a child that, yeah, you won, um, yeah, and but they got the decision. Mm -hmm. And especially as amateurs, you would think there's no money. All I ever got told as an amateur is for the love of the sport. And mm -hmm. they are, they're right with that. But, something's not quite right mm. the system has to run itself and we've got children so why would children want to get into that so yeah. we're harming ourselves mm. in the long term uh, definitely and in the short term but it's you know it, it is good to get the the realistic viewpoint of it you know as well that you know people can see that there are highs and there are some tremendous achievements you can you can get to but there are lows and there are, you know, there are sort of landmines that you've got to step around yes, and step, yes, step yes. on, you know, in the sport. So it's, it's good to get a highlight of that as well. Um, talking about, you know, the highs and the lows, um, your, your professional career had both of those as well. Um, and we were, we were mentioning just now that, you know, you got off to this fast start, you know, you were, you were knocking people out, you were, you know, really making a name for yourself. And then I think it was your, your 11th fight where there was a professional fight now, where there was a, so a surprise defeat, uh, first round defeat, I believe. And, you know, this sort of shocked a lot of people. You obviously bounced back from it. I like to touch on this, not to, not to dwell on, you know, something that went wrong, but more from the point of view of, of how a person can bounce back from, um, you know, an obstacle, they can bounce back from something that's, that's unexpected, you know, with, with what happened in, in that, uh, I believe it was your 11th fight, but correct me if I'm wrong. How did you bounce back from this? How did you bounce back? 
Yes, it was my 13th fight. And, and, and I think I bounced back many times. Amateur teaches you that. When you lose, you bounce back. In coaching, training, you bounce back. My mm. coach taught me that you're going to lose more than you're going to win. And he meant not just in boxing, he meant in life itself. To progress forward, to move forward, sometimes that bitterness of losing is the magic needed. Mm. That's what's needed. Sometimes you can win 20 fights, 30 fights, and take it for granted. And, and it, so it's not, there's not a lot to learn from that because you're doing everything right. Tick the box, tick the box. And in life, it gets like that. And then when something comes from nowhere, something small and significant can crush you. My losing my place for the Olympics crushed me. Mm. And at the time, uh, and I still think that, I, I, as I, deep down, it makes me think my face didn't fit. Because the only reason I could think of at the time, because I was doing everything that anybody asked. And I was, a, I was a, part of my upbringing. I wanted to please people. If it meant putting myself down sometimes. And as a fighter, if I lost, I took it hard, but I didn't show. I just went home and dealt with it. My coach taught me to get back on the road. It's as simple as that. So having lost my Olympic place, mm. having lost the, 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 to me, would have been a gold medal. I say that. I really do believe I would, I would have won a gold medal back in uh, 87. And, and then having that thrown first. And then coming back the next year and winning the, Olymp winning the ABAs with knockouts all the way through and not getting the talk. Harry Carpenter used to be a great talker at the time. He, was, he did big me up, but he always did. But the boxing fraternity didn't. Mm. That, was an, that was an impeccable thing. Then I came back to turn uh, amateur and I thought, I've got to turn this around. I've got to turn this around. I've got to turn this around. And then as he said, as a professional, I then got a winning, because I thought, what do you want to see? Knockouts, knockouts, knockouts. So I'd gone to 11 fights and 12 fights, 12 knockouts. But I was getting in the ring with heavyweights. I was in the ring with light heavyweights. Mm -hmm. And they were being told that they were lighter than they really were. They were eight stone seven and I was eight, I was eight. Sorry, there was 10, was 11 stone eight and there was 11, and they, they were not, they were 13 stone. And, now here's where the problem came, and here's where my downfall came, and here's where I lost my place in the Olympics. It was how to make weight. I did not know how to make weight. So when I lost my place in the Olympics to a, a young fighter from Wales, um, Wales, uh, God's the name now, his, name, his name's eluded me, Wayne, Wayne Ellis, should never have beaten me, but he did. When the dust was settled, he was victorious. Now, I couldn't, I'd got cut the previous fight in the ABAs. So I'd never had a cut before. So I wasn't sure. They said, keep it dry and don't let it get wet. So I can't sweat. So I can't drain. So I had to lose literally 10 pounds the day before the fight. The same thing was happening through my whole career. The damaging, what, what you've always heard this saying, haven't you? Amateur that turn pro don't always do good as a professional. Mm. I couldn't, I used to hear that all the time. He might have been a good amateur, but he's not a good pro. And I'll tell you why. I really believe the reason is we are conditioned to make weight in such a wrong way that we have not got the ability that, that we're, de we're dehydrated, which means your ability to take a punch is gone. You are now a vulnerable individual, but you got away with it for three rounds. You would not get away with it for six rounds. Mm. If you're dehydrated, you, you don't recover. If you get dehydrated, you weigh in today, you will be four or five days before you, your body's recovered. Well, you're boxing the same day. You're boxing the next day. So what was happening was I got into this pattern of training so hard. That was a mistake. I was overtraining, leaving at the gym. And then I'd come back and I'd be like, wow you're a stone overweight and you're boxing next week. And because I wasn't getting these dates for fights, I was getting, we've got a fight for you Thursday. Uh, what, five days away? Yeah. Oh, okay. Now make sure you get down to 11 stone, 11, 11 stone, 11, 11 stone, like middleweight, because that's what you're complaining as. Why can't I just come in naturally? These guys are heavier than me. You're a light middleweight. 
So I would have to boil down every time. And I can tell you now, I went through fights where I shouldn't have been in the ring. Mm. I was that boiled down. And only my reputation got me through that fight. The guys stayed away from me. Yeah, or I was able to land a bomb early and, and discourage them or take them out. The fight that I lost against Paul Wesley was his record was I'm going to tell you something. You can work it out for yourself, I suppose, and all the people listening can. I boxed Paul Wesley. His record was, at the time, I think 27 fights. Um, he stopped two. I was the third opponent. I've been in the ring with big bangers. I boxed. Uh, once I knew I'd got to him, um, Nubby Nubs was his coach, one of the best trainers I could say I've ever trained with. Tricks he knows, brilliant in training. Taught me about, I had no discipline, I was throwing shots with my chin in the air, I had no body, I had nothing. I was I had great athletic ability, but my boxing skills, because I no longer with, was with Mickey, Mickey was bringing my, enhancing my skills, never letting me overtrain. Once he departed from my side after two or three years, I was left with all the coaches and going from coach to coach. England coaches too. So when I came back to the Wesley fight, weight was drained. I took the fight. Are you ready for this? Up until this point, being a prospect, I was boxing for 800 pounds. Yeah. I had 12 fights and my biggest payment was 800 pounds. I was on the dole when I boxed for the British title. I had to retire from my job to concentrate and be what I thought was a professional full time to box Frank Grant for the, for the British title. With Wesley, I was holding the job down, struggling, physical job, drained, couldn't make weight. But my brain said, no. They, they put my money up to 1,500, Mickey Duff. And I felt like, oh, that's a bit of money. I mean, I looked at who, who, who'd already beaten Wesley. And Wesley was what I would you call a journeyman. He just took money and boom. To this day, he's probably the strongest fighter I've been in the ring with as a professional. Mm -hmm. And to back that up, Steve Collins said the same thing. There's two people I boxed that I could not believe how strong they were. It was Neville Brown and Paul Wesley. And I went, I can vouch to that because I boxed Paul Wesley. Now, when I boxed Paul, I dehydrated myself so bad that I was having headaches. And when I had to lean forward and I had to pick some washing up and put the washing into the washing machine, I couldn't bend forward. My head felt like it was going to open and my brain was going to fall out. The pain was intense. I don't drink. I do have a drink. I've never been drunk. I'm not, I don't drink beer, I don't really do the drink side of it. But I imagine that's how uh, 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 the aftermath of drinking would be. <laughs> you, you can't move your head. It was like, I, I did not want to get punched in my head. But then my brain said, yeah, but he's not a puncher. So I got in the ring with Paul Wesley, thinking I'll just outmaneuver him. All these guys have stopped him. I hit harder than them, I believe. And, uh, he took me to school. He took me to school in the first round. And he hit me with a shot and my brain went, what? This guy, I couldn't work out how, I thought the referee had kicked me. <laughs> John Coyle was my referee that day. He was my favorite referees. And I, I got hit, I moved away. He was such a great fighter. He'd learned the trade so well. He pressured me onto the ropes and he hit me the hover and right again and I went over. I got up and my brain was just like, what's happened? I was in a shock. And I went back to the corner and I stood up and, and John was looking at me. To this day, I was how clear it was. My dad watched my first fight for the first time in his life. He did not like me boxing. <laughs> and he came and watched me and I get stopped in the first round by a guy called Paul Wesley. And I'm like, this happened before. It happened with um, the Olympics. I lost my place because of Wayne Ellis. And it was a similar thing, body weight. And then when I spoke to 
Well, the referee said to me, Neville, I have to stop the fight. You're not showing any. I goes, yeah, I understand. <laughs> that was my answer to him. Because I couldn't work out how this guy just dropped me. And he hasn't got a record of a puncher. So was, was I in danger of being so dehydrated? I, I recognized that I wasn't in the best shape. And he stopped me and I walked back to the corner. I walked back to the dressing room and I just sat there. And then from that point onwards, I was always labeled as chinny. I was always labeled as um, fragile. The riot ups were always, he had a bit of a wobble here, but he came through. But I was creating that position by being drained and overtraining and, uh, and not eating and two or three days for fights, not drinking. And you can get to a stage where you, you, you can make, you can actually work this into your training. It's wrong. It is so, so wrong. In our sport where people get injured. And like I said, I went to that ring. Anyway, I had a rematch with Wesley. You can clear, I was, I was ready, I was dead, I was ready for the fight. And then it's a funny one, this is. On the second fight we had, I had one more warm-up and I was really angry. Uh, Gary, the late Gary Mason was saying to me, You sure you want this? I was like, Yeah, I want this more than anything. And I wanted to have a war with Paul. <laughs> I wanted to go to have a big scrap with him. And then two weeks of before the fight, um, or the week of the fight, he cancelled and said, he's not feeling well. And I went, huh? Can we put the fight back? So he, as a journeyman, stopped the show in Burton, my hometown, and put it back two weeks. I thought, how come he can do that? But I couldn't do that. I don't get this. And I, so on the night we should have boxed, I went out to a place called Hummingbird in Birmingham. And all the Birmingham fighters ran up to me and said, Neville, you're boxing poor. I goes, yeah, I know. And I, and I was like, ego is hurt. I'm going to kill him. I'm going to do this. I goes, yeah. But Neville, he's not the same fighter. I goes, what do you mean? I goes, he's just come back from Italy. He hasn't got the decision over 10 rounds. He's just beat a guy. I might pronounce his name wrong. I think his name was Quinnell or Quill. Quillel, something like that. And it was a warm-up for the world title. Never. He just beat the world number one. But wasn't given the decision. So it gave me mind to re thought to reflect. But okay. So I went back home. I trained differently and I changed my approach. And if you've if ever seen the fight, I, I become the boxer because I want to check what's going on with them. So rather than going to have a war with them, I went and like, I'll box him. And after eight rounds, I went on, went on points. I thought, how can this guy be a journeyman? He's world class. And I'd hit him with some banging shots. Sean Cummins banged him out. Rod, everybody else banged him out, and I, and I thought I hit as hard as them. And yeah, he took my shots, and I thought, what's going on here? Anyway, having won the fight, I then went to his camp, because at this point, I turned professional, and Mickey Duff had said to me, I'm going to go to Florida, and I've been working with, with Lloyd Honiger, getting him prepared for his world-class fight. I thought, yeah, where do I sign? And I signed my life away at that point. So now I was under contract now for three years with Mickey Duff. He was a giant in the game. And if you weren't shining in him, he controlled everything you did. And I then well, found myself a year and a half later still training in Burton on Trent on my own because I couldn't train with the amateurs no more. So I turned pro and I was just training myself. I was lost. And on this, this fight woke me up against Wesley to say, you need help. Then I went back to, um, I went to, I joined their gym for a year and I had some great sparring and technique and they corrected me and put me right again. I put my head right and that's some great sparring with, uh, with Paul. And then I moved away from the gym and I joined Brendan's gym, Brendan Ingalls. And then it was all started again, I suppose, from there. New beginning, new way of training, which was difficult to change. When you're a solid athlete, you work a certain way. And we did body sparring there, which is something I didn't understand at the time. I do now. I'm no longer boxing. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it is fascinating though to get into so much just behind the scenes as well because you know there's so many things that I mean, I know this from, from working in, in the media aspect of boxing, but there's so many things you don't see just from watching the fight that go on behind the scenes. It's so, and I don't mean the obvious aspect of people work hard to train, because obviously they do, but there's so much with the weight, with the promoters, with, you know, what the, what your opponent's going through, as you mentioned, you know, he beat the world number one, he came back. There's so many other things, and getting an insight into that is 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 fascinating, because it's something that people in the game know but you know fans watching this they just don't see um so you know and that's and they see only actually a very small fraction of of boxing you know of what actually goes on really you know whereas when you're behind the scenes you're in people's camps you're in all this stuff you know you see uh, a whole different you know a whole other world really that's going on in, in there uh, obviously you know with this we have to move on to one of your biggest achievements and i know with this we're now skipping forward um a few fights including a few more knockouts by the way you know because you were uh you were putting them away but when it comes to actually winning the, the british title um itself you know and that and as i mentioned i know we've like i said i've tried to pick a few key ones so i know we've skipped over a few but winning the british title itself i want to talk about that because you mentioned earlier about um sort of going on a dole and, and things and, and I, it's not the first time i've heard that it's not always as glamorous as, as what people think it is but it is still an amazing achievement, um, I, I think, you know, that it's, it's an amazing achievement to be, you know, the best in Britain at that weight, so, win such a prestigious belt, we can, we can show us the belt in a moment. But I'd like to talk about the fight, and with this, it's the same type of thing, really. I, I don't have the question about, you know, this, this round or this particular thing, but just your memories of the fight, you know, what went on, the build-up to it, the fight itself. Uh, also, you know, I'd be interested in... Um, what people's reaction was like, you know, after you won. Um, but let's just let's just walk through the fight a little bit, you know, and, and how it all went down with uh, with winning the British title. That would be amazing. Well, well I realised now I was tied into a contract with a guy called Mickey Duff, who wasn't doing what he said he would do, and I couldn't get him to change. And I had a little conversation with Mickey Watson, Michael Watson, and I then realised. I had problems because I can't get this man into court to get my contract free and to move on. So I've got to take fights as and when he gives me. So I'm having to live in a gym, but there's no funds. I'm, I've got to get a job. And so therefore I was struggling. So I knew I didn't think I was going to make it as a, as a, as, or I didn't think I was going to perform and do well as a professional, which I felt professionalism was better than the, the amateurs. The three rounds was good, but I love 12 round, 15 round fights. But I had to get the, the training right, I had to get the nutrition right, I had to get the food. and I couldn't afford this. And I didn't have the coaches, so I was training myself. So meeting Nobby Nobs, he corrected me. And then meeting a few other people along the line, good coaches along the way, they all put me in, I started to get a picture of what's going on. So when, when I realized then, when the fight came up with, with Frank Grant, as soon as I saw him beat Errol Graham, I then knew I'm next. And, and the reason why I knew is that he'd want an established fighter's name, me, who was hot and cold, because that was the, the way I was coming across in my performances, sensational win, then not so good a win. But that was down to basically, I was dead at the weight. I did not know how to make weight. And, and, and it was a difficult transition to get that right. I didn't know how to get it right by training too hard, by not training as hard, and then different coaches with different tactics. It's very difficult to get that right. And I had to go back to Burton, my old amateur ways. And I started training like I did as an amateur when I won the schoolboys. I started doing them again. And I realized that, wow, this is hard. This is how I used to train. I had to recondition that with the new information I'd got. So when I got Frank Grant, I looked at my friend Ivan and I said, Ivan Dubs, I said, when I watch him beat Earl Graham, I thought, it's gonna be me and Grant. It's, it's Grant I've got to beat. Nobody wants him. He's got a no name himself. He's a terrible fighter, fearful fighter in the sense, that's what I mean. Nobody wants him. He's scary, strong, raw, southpaw, and he's just destroyed Earl Bomber Graham. No one wants us. 
So I knew that's who I'm boxing. And in my mind, the way I used to train on a punch bag, shadow boxing, if I knew what you looked like and how you moved, I've got you. And I could mimic you and I train how to beat you and what you like doing, I want you to get a look at it. What I'm doing, I'll exploit what you're doing. So quite an easy one. Frank Grant, strong, powerful. Two ways to box him. I can have a war with him, or I can jab and move and score shots from a distance, damage him, take him into later rounds, and then jump on him. That was the battle plan. So I got the fight. I go to my job. I moved house to Derby. I get a house, paid rent, and me and my dog, Shabba, <laughs> We're in his house and I just totally cut everybody off. And I just go into training. There's a park on my doorstep. Every morning I'm training, I'm walking. So for three, four months, the beauty of this is that Frank gave me time to train for this fight. Whereas other people was like two weeks notice, change of opponent, blah, blah, blah. And their opponents were getting more money than me. So I was getting very miffed. And now lost my job in a sense of walked in and said, I got to go and focus on this, I've got to stop the job. And they were like, uh, okay, no job, on the dole, moved house. And it because sometimes I was driving to Sheffield to train. I had no petrol, I had no insurance. <laughs> I was struggling to get his there. I had to somehow get my car, get me to Sheffield to train, and I was broke. And when I won that title, when I beat Frank Grant, it was about, it wasn't about the British title. It was about, I had to put a plan together. If they get to wobble me, catch me with a shot, they are going to stop this fight instantly. If they, they're not going to give me time to get ready, I had to spar and I had to train. And so I went in there with a the mission and everything they did, when I climbed into the ring, I had no gloves on, I wasn't allowed to warm up. So when I got into the ring, I had to put the gloves on. And yet when I waited for, for um, Frank to come into the ring, he was all gloved up, sweating and ready. But I was already ready in my head. I'd slept, I dreamed about this guy. I even actually dreamed two fights, one where I won. <laughs> and the next day I woke up, I was so upset because it was a dream, it not happened. And I thought, I'm gonna go for it. It was a scary ordeal. You couldn't enjoy that. Nobody can enjoy that when you know that if I were to lose this, I would just disappear. And it was always my dream and I knew I could shine, but I wasn't getting the best sparring partners and I was just doing body sparring and it didn't work for me body sparring. So my timing was out. So I was a bit worried. I went back to Burton and I trained at the amateur gym and I trained it on my own there. And I was like isolated for three months with me and my dog. <laughs> and I still had good people around me, by the way, who could help out with whatever. I had a young lady who was feeding me, but I never told her that I had no money for food because I'm in the paper every week and never boxing for the world title and blah, 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 whatever, be it, be it not world title, but British title. So everybody thinks I'm successful, but I can't feed myself. And this young lady was feeding me. I told her years later. <laughs> You're the reason why I won that title. And I explained the food, good food you fed me. But that's how I was. I was not what people thought. I was isolated. I was on my own. I wasn't getting the sparring. I wasn't getting the pad work. So I had to think in my head, how do I do this then? I was, don't get me wrong, I was body sparring. I was down at gyms and I was working, but I wasn't getting sparring that I could open up on people. Not that I think you need to, but I needed that little bit of in my punch, a little devil in my punch when I throw it. So I haven't got that. I got to go and take on one of the most fierce fighters coming through who's just destroyed the, the, the man himself, Errol Bomber Graham. Yeah? Wow. And then I watched Frank Grant destroy uh, or beat um, John Ashton. I thought, yeah, he's strong. John Ashton is a boxer, good mover. I thought, yep, yeah, so I've got to do, I've got to really move. I get into the ring, boom, boom, no gloves on, grubbed up, warmed up, watching everybody and thinking, right. And I was in a, like a trance. I can't put it any better way. Everything I knew, everything he started to do, I'd read him, I knew what he was doing before he did it. And I just simply outboxed him. I didn't, I didn't get involved with him. 
tied him up, moved away. And I then realized I wasn't meant to win this fight. And I knew I'd have to stop him. But I also knew no human being on this world can take punishment. They can't take hits. And I hit pretty good. Even from a boxing format. I would listen to some people watching the fight on a video once and they're saying, but Neville's not getting involved. No, I'm doing a, what's called a Mayweather, I suppose. I'm hit, not be hit. But I'm also hurting him. There is a difference. It's not exciting the way people want to see when I bought Sean Cummins. It's not as exciting as that, where it's a brawl in some way with a bit of boxing. This was, I'm not getting involved. I'm keeping you out and I'm going to damage you round by round by round. And it just happened, it came off. And then I think it was a seventh round, sixth round, I think we, I, I, I turned southpaw and I hit him with a backhand and caught the eye and I cut him. And he had a bad cut now. And he was now, he had to rush me. And then I thought, I've got loads in the engine. I've had time to get ready for this fight in the sense of time-wise, not weight drained or nothing. And uh, uh, I cluttered him to a finish. Didn't finish him the way I'd like to have finished him, but that was because my timing was a little bit out. And the man was a monster. And to this day, I have nothing but respect for, for Frank Grant because to be honest, he didn't have to fight. At the time, at the pinnacle, when he could have excelled, because I had the European champ, uh, a championship for that, and there's no way I should have lost to this young lad, but I did. Um, and I still think with the, the dedication that Frank had, he either won the European and gone on to the world title scene. And I've, I've told him that often when, when I see him. Your mm -hmm. discipline was everyday training. I was in and out, struggling with food, struggling with coaches, struggling with an arena to train in. No, no fight camps. Apart from the one I made up, <laughs> living on my own for three months for Frank Grant. That was probably the closest to a fight camp. Wow. It's incredible. I mean, not only the win is an incredible achievement anyway, but everything that you went through. I mean, again, you know, um, seeing the fight is one thing. Obviously, I've, I've seen the fight, but, you know, the, the struggle, basically, you know, for, for want of a better term, that you went through on the, on the build-up to it makes winning that you know, double, I, in my eyes, of just my personal opinion, you know, an achievement because everything was stacked against you there. So that has got to be, that is really something special, you but know. It, but, it was, but it was scary. I, I forgot about the British belt, by the way, see you. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> the Lonsdale belt. I'd never thought about this. All I ever thought about was the world title. I'd never thought about a Lonsdale belt. I thought, well, I'll get that along the way. I actually thought that. I think as a fighter, you'd think that. But I actually forgot about it. It was just me and Frank Grant. <laughs> it was me and Frank Grant. And everybody else who wanted to pull me down, trip me up, I just said, the best way I can do this is to go isolate myself and focus purely on myself, not selfishly, but just on the boxing time, this is what i got to do. Sparring partners, I couldn't spar the kind of guys I needed to spar. So it was a matter of me being careful with them, not to hurt them. And, 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 and it's like, this is not the way I thought boxing for a world title would be. be. And the publicity and being positive on that, and never, say, never showing the signs that you're struggling. And I think I, think I cried when, I, when, I, when the commentators started asking me, how do you feel? It was so empowering that I kind of done it. And I felt alone when I did this. And I didn't want to feel alone. I wanted to, all the people who helped me along the way. I had a lot of people who emotionally helped me, and but they didn't have the funds or the or the contacts to push me. So I'm not saying I did it on my own, but a lot of people in the boxing world, I just I don't know if it was just this a good fighter, but he's vulnerable. Mm, but it was the fact that I was taking on so many fights. It wasn't just the boxer. I was taking on the referees. I was taking on the judges. I was taking on the, the promoters. I was taking on the media. The media yeah. wanted, they, they can take you a certain direction and make you, and then they can crush you. And the, every right up I ever had, I felt that I'm not being, I'm not, I'm not, get, I'm not getting the, the, the good write ups here. I mean, it's just fact. And not just me, a lot of fighters, if you didn't fit, the right criteria, you were not going to get a look. 
I'd be in a, I'd, a lot of my fights have not been seen because TV and videos weren't around. So some of the toughest fights I've had in the back halls and whatever was me and another tough mother. Yeah. That's where I was getting my, my cred from because people goes, yeah, we don't want him. But meanwhile, him and that me and um, uh, Sean Cummings, nobody wanted him. He was, I was already written off to box Sean. And I thought, okay. <laughs> and then we, had, we had ended, ended up going for a fight toe-to-toe. -to -toe. I showed another side of myself, yeah? But it was still boxing. Yeah. But, it, but, I, but I was, it, it, it's still boxing. I'm going forward, I'm being aggressive. Not every shot I'm throwing is powerful. It's timed. And the power's there, as you saw with the fight. And I took a guy apart who was supposedly strong, who was already written in to box Steve Collins. Getting ready for uh, getting ready for Steve Collins was the fight, but I wasn't told about Steve Collins, and I was never a middleweight. I was only a light middleweight, really. But <laughs> I couldn't get the train properly, so it was really uh, frustrating in some ways. But I was in the ring with bigger guys. Andy Flute was an example. Big lads. Steve Collins was a twelve stoner. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Steve Collins because I think with this, obviously there's a lot of brilliant fights that you had, you know, and as I mentioned, there's too many to, to get into today, which is, you know, almost a bit of a shame really, because there were some great defenses of the British title that you had as well, absolutely fantastic, you know, um, even where you eventually lost the British title against Glenn Catley, you know, that was still, that was still a good one actually, you know, as a fight. Um, but, you know, there's so many in there. There's also European title challenges, the Commonwealth title. But one, I think, because after we've talked about this fight, you know, for the sake of, of, of time and your schedule and mine, I didn't want to talk about the uh, the Neville Brown philosophy and, and some of your current work before we before we wrap up. But as, as the last fight to really sort of hone in on and really focus on properly, Steve Collins, I mean, everybody knows about that fight. Everybody knows that... Um, you know, it's a fight that's gone down in history, you know, he's the most successful Irish boxer of, you know, the modern era and, you know, everything he's accomplished with, with um, you know, beating uh, Nigel Benn and Chris Eubank and the hypnosis um, before. Yep, 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 I actually went yep. to a talk with Glenn Catley um, where he talked about his experiences of hypnosis before fights and also discussed um, Steve Collins' hypnosis because apparently they were mates. So, that you know, there, there was, uh, there's a bunch of interesting things about this fight. So in the same way, you know, your own words, challenging for the world title. I know, you know, the fight didn't go your way in the end, but it's an amazing achievement, challenging for one, especially because um, from what I've heard so far, it doesn't sound like you had a lot of luck with, with a number of things with, you know, short notice fights and the training, but, you know, you stayed positive and, you, you know, to a degree, and you kept moving forward, which is, which is, I've got a lot of respect for that. So the world title challenge, let's talk about it a little bit, you know, in terms of what happened before. I know there was there was some um, weight related things with, with that fight as well. There's a few different things. So in your own words, challenging for the for the world title, um, let's let's get into it a little bit. The build up to the fight, the fight itself, you okay. know, the same type of thing. This okay. would be a good okay. one. I suppose in some sad way, but no, I don't, I don't look at it as a sad way, but it, it does seem it was a highlight of my life, Colin Spine. Why? I'd always dreamed, after seeing Sugar Ray Leonard box with Roberto Duran in the first fight, 15 rounds, and that point onwards, I wanted to be a world champion. Against another man, I don't fear, I do fear, but I would go against anybody. I never showed fear. I would always go against it. I believed in myself in that sense. One-on-one, -on -one, man on man, I always thought I could hold my own. And I think I've proven that over the years. So with Steve Collins was, um, I didn't know I was boxing. I beat Sean Cummings. I felt good because I'd gone back, I got back some of my training motivation. And I could sense talking to Barry McGuigan and talking to other people on Sky. And I'm thinking, wow, these guys have actually written me off. And I can tell by their tone of voice. But never you got, but I go, yeah, but you know how the game works. You know how if you're not being allocated the time slots and the time to get ready. So the Steve Collins fight turned up. I get a phone call. I just moved into the house that I'm in now. And Derby, I've moved into the house. And I thought, just moved in on the 23rd of December. 
and the next Christmas, Christmas I enjoyed, and then on the New Year's Eve, I get a phone call. Steve Collins. I goes, yeah. Do you fancy him? And I went, well, Steve Collins. And I went, yeah. What? Uh, for the for the for the world title. And I went, oh well, yeah. God, I wasn't sure if it was a ten rounder or something. I goes, hell yeah. And in my head, that instant, I thought, this is world title stage. I'm gonna have three months of preparation, the best sparring, the best pad work, the best everything, the best nutrition. We're on. Yes. <laughs> he goes, right, excellent. I goes, right. So we'll get we'll get in contact with him and sort of like, wow, when to fight? And he went, uh, sudden to sudden day. I went, isn't that four weeks away? And they went, yeah, I go, oh, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. You want me to take on Steve Collins, who's a natural super middleweight? I'm a blown up middleweight. Give me four weeks notice. And at this point, I didn't have a trainer. I had to ring Brendan and say, Brendan, I've been I'll give him the, the chance to fight for the world title against Steve Collins. Um, what do you think? Because with Sean Cummings, Brendan was in my corner and his family, but they didn't train me for that. I had to go away and find out why I wasn't performing well. So I went back to amateur status, what I used to do and how I used to, and I mimicked what I used to do as a kid. And that brought me back to Sean Cummings' win. Now it's back in the flavor again. So, hmm, interesting. I'm going to keep it like this. But now I've been given this big opportunity and it was above me. This was the world title. And, and I was like, wow. Uh, and the idea I'm going to have big money was 45000 It's a joke for a world title. I said, no, nah, nah, I can't take this fight. It's too short notice. I'm, I'm not a body. You know, I want a true crack at the world title. Okay, basically, if you don't take it, we'll go somewhere else. But we won't come back to you again. That sounded pretty dark, that did. I goes, yeah, but I'm being correct here. This is good for boxing, isn't it? Me backing out of a fight that I'm not prepared for. I'm not saying I don't want it. <laughs> I want three months training. I had no bartering. I couldn't barter. If I was the money man, I could dictate when and when I fight. So I reluctantly said, okay. Put the phone down, went on a five mile run. <laughs> And just thought about it and thought, all I gotta do is be in the best shape I can. If as long as I can make a good account of myself, I'll live with that. And that's all I did. I just wanted to make a good account of myself. And then um, I focused on that. Uh, I was training good fights at Brenda with the body spine. Johnny Nelson was helping me out with the body spine. It, is, it was body spine. It's, to me, it's not boxing. Um, but it was a good workout and I was looking good and I was open, I was enthusiastic. But in four weeks, you can only really get six good rounds of world class in you. you after that, you, you're on borrowed time. And I couldn't dictate the pace. I couldn't use the weight in my favor. I couldn't use my legs the way I did with the Frank Grant because I didn't have the conditioning to do it. So what I had to do was go inside close against Steve and use his weight against him because he, he throws shots wide. So when I stayed inside, he couldn't catch me with nothing. And so that was how the fight went. So when, when the fight came about, there was questions of, how do you feel? I said, I'm excited. Do you think you can re beat Steve Collins? I said, yeah. I wouldn't get in the ring if I didn't think I could. Lie. Because <laughs> I know I'm not prepared right, but I still got the same mentality that I can beat this guy. And people are saying to me, you're boxing Steve Collins. And I went, yeah. How do you feel? Because I'm fine, why? Uh, this would be at a bar or a restaurant, and then they go, Yeah, but it's Steve Collins. I goes, Aren't you scared? I goes, uh, well, 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 where is he? Is he in the room? And it's like, Oh, you're a comedian, are you? <laughs> I go, Why am I going to be scared until the bell goes? Then you can ask for that question. So I'm like, Wow, I'm totally written off here. And I'm like, So I'm training for the fight, just getting on with it. It's the way it is. I think a week before the fight, to have a car crash. My friend gets whiplash. I get whiplash, but didn't understand. It didn't kick in until two days after the car crash. So 
that's gone with my back a little bit because I broke my back as a kid and I didn't know until after the fight with Steve Collins. So, um, so here I am, Steve Collins, fight comes up, we go to talk, media, microphone in face. So you're boxing Steve Collins? Uh, yeah. How do you feel about him being hypnotized and all the rest of it? I goes, I'm cool. <laughs> I guess, it doesn't bother you. I goes, no, why should it? Like, well, it, bothered, it bothered Chris Eubanks. I goes, yeah, but I'm not Chris Eubanks. And they, they goes, oh, fair enough then. And I goes, so it doesn't bother you? I goes, no, because I think every fighter really talks himself into fight. Look at Muhammad Ali. I'm the greatest. And this is my philosophy. You talk about NBP promotions and skills. It's about finding the champion inside you. So Ali was saying, I'm the greatest. So I'm saying, I'm the greatest. Or in this particular fight, I'm good enough. <laughs> yeah? And that's the mental. So I always tell myself what I'm doing, how I'm feeling, how I'm working, how I'm doing. To this day, if I don't feel good, I don't feel good. I ain't got to lie to myself. But that's how we all talk to ourselves. Whether someone else needs someone to go, look into the watch and tell me if you are going to win this fight, you are. I don't need that. I can already do that. So I'm in the ring. I'm getting ready to fight. Get there. Move in. I get weighed in. I have two breakfasts to make the weight. Because <laughs> I'm like 11, 10. And they say, uh, you've got to be 12 stone, Brendan says. I go, I know, but I'm eating as much as I can. And I'm, and I just, I'm training hard. And I'm not weight drained at all. Because obviously the weight. And I'm like, but, I, but I'm, I'm like, I, to make the weight, 12 stone, I'm basically two breakfasts. Met the way, way in. Steve comes in. I can see he's sucked in, dried out. <laughs> if you had to fight now, he's done. <laughs> yeah. But by the time 24 hours later, think about it. It's not 24 hours. It's 36 hours later. Yeah. He's ballooned out now. And I would say he's not far off 14 stone by the time we get into that ring. And um, weight's a big advantage. He, he, if, he hand, if he lands one on you, with the weight advantage, he's knocking me about, not hurting me as such. Um, if you, I don't think he's got the devastating power of a Nigel Ben or somebody, or Chris Eubanks at that weight, but he's definitely got weight. If you, if you think of a two pound bag of sugar and how heavy that is, think, four, think of seven of them mm -hmm. and so on. But yeah, so he's got the weight to knock you off balance if he can half catch you. So the fight kicks off. I'm feeling confident, I'm ready for the fight, I'm buzzing. First round, I think I'm winning. I'm out of trouble. And then I'm not no sparring. So the first shot that comes in, I'm a little bit rusty. And I dip in and it catches the back of the head. And then the sheer weight of him and the clumsiness of Steve, <laughs> he's very clumsy with it. Very, because he's a very good boxer. But for some reason, after the Chris Eubanks fight, he becomes very, he goes into this hyper warrior mode. But he is a very good boxer. So he's, he's, he's carrying that on to me a little bit and for the hype of the family, for the crowd and stuff. So he catches me here and I go over and I get up. I think, shit, I just lost that round. And then, okay, I get up. And Brendan goes, keep outside, keep moving, keep moving. Catch him on the way in. I goes, okay, okay. So the second round starts. He throws a big clumsy shot and catches me on the shoulder. Spins me and I hit the, and I'm on the wet patch in my corner. And I touch down and I get another standing count. And I'm like, Oh, I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to get me out of the way. So as soon as I took the count, and I argued with the referee that I didn't get hit, he hit my shoulder. Uh, I'm now two, two rounds in, two standing counts. I'm miffed. And I just, and I just, I just goes, right, I'm coming after you. And I went straight into him. And I found that he wasn't as strong as I thought he'd be. Because I've got Johnny Nelson and heavyweights and Pele Reed pushing me around the ring. He doesn't possess that kind of strength. So I'm battling with Steve, and I'm, I'm actually getting the better of him. And his punches aren't bothering me, and he can't actually hit me. He's throwing them too wide. I can stay here. And everybody says to me, why are you fighting with him? I goes, well, I'm not actually. <laughs> I'm actually comfortable here, because he can't hit me with these shots. So I'm going to use my speed and stay inside. Plus, I haven't got the legs to do 12 rounds at the speed I wanted to do, and the in and out movement I'd want to do, and the weight factor. And he's an intelligent fighter. So I took it to him and I realized he's blowing. So by round five, round six, he's gassing. I thought, if I could stay in here and just keep out of trouble. But I'm, the rounds are far too close. And to be honest, I'm not going to say I was winning. I, I, I was keeping out of trouble. I wasn't marked up. 
But I got I sustained a cut in the about sixth round, I think. And then I thought, right, we're going to get stopped here. Now I'm starting to get tired. And I got, uh, I was battling with him, but he's just the biggest, more superior fighter. So I'm off the ropes, coming off the ropes, thinking, okay, we'll just see if we can pick a few shots here and there. And I'm now just entertaining the crowd, really. Uh, I'm thinking they're not going to let me have this fight if it's close anyway. I'm not going to get damaged just because of that. And then I think it was round 10. He's coming towards me and I clocks him. And then he tapers towards me and goes down. I go, I nailed it. And he's gone down. And they put it as a slip. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I kind of hurt this guy. Why did I think I couldn't hurt this guy? Right? And he gets up and then the bell goes and I go to my corner and Brendan sees the shot and he's seen that, how hard I hit on pads. And he goes, you nailed him there. We go back to the corner, but I'm exhausted at this point. And I'm just like, um, I'm like, just, just exhausted, just dehydrated a lot. And I'm going to tell you something about my weight. So I can ask you as well, if you can guess it. I then comes out for the 11. My guys are pumping me up. And I thought, Right, I gotta stick close to him. When I stick close to him, he can't get, to, he can't throw nothing. But in the process of trying to stay close to him, he catches me with a lovely shot, spins me, right, I fall over, I roll over, I get up, I'm exhausted, but I'm not hurt. I thought, I get up, and I look at the referee, and I think I, I wink at Collins and go, and the referee's looking at me, and I go, Do you wanna carry on? I go, Hell yeah. And I carry on walking towards him. I'm trying to get close to him again to make him work. So every time he worked, as soon as he finished, I started on him to make him have to work harder. So I wasn't, getting, I wasn't letting him have a breather. And I could hear him breathing. And then when we got to the um, 11th round, and I, I did his step to him, he threw a couple of shots, and I'm boom, and I've gone over. I got up, I goes to him again, and the referee jumps in and goes, just as I was kind of saving myself for a final finale. But I, I, I wasn't hurt, and I was just exhausted, and I was... What an experience. And, and with Steve, today we're good friends today when I meet him and talk. And he talks highly of me to this day. He talks about one of his hardest fights was me. And I'm just proud to have that in there. I'd love to have had 12 rounds of training, though. Who knows, yeah? But after the fight, I got drug tested before the fight. Okay? Nothing new. But after the fight, I got drug tested again. So I was dehydrated and I couldn't pee. I had to wait an hour. And everybody went home and I was on my own in this place with a doctor. So I finally peed and they did the test on me. And then I was like, I know, I know I'm okay. And I goes back on the bus, on my own, driving back to the hotel. And it's quiet. And I'm, and I'm coming out of the arena, onto the bus, to the hotel. People are seeing me and they're like, bigging me up like I won the world title or something. And I was like, I gave it a go. Oh, it was an amazing fight. Well done. I goes, thanks. I saw the scales because they're next door to me in the bedroom next door. So I climbed onto them. How much do you think I weighed? At that point, um, gosh, I mean, you, you had to be, I mean, I remember reading with the fight, obviously, that, that you were at quite a, at a better weight, you know, for yourself. But if that was true, I don't know. So, uh, I wasn't drained at making the way. Yeah. I was yeah. Meals and three, I could eat what I wanted. That's right. You could eat anything you wanted for this one. So I, I would have thought you'd be at a better weight. But saying that, it depends how much you lost of it in, in sweating and in the heat of it. You know, fight, yeah, I'm talking about the 40 minute fight. I weighed him before yeah. the fight. I was going Did down. You a lot less. Like a lot less. One. I was 12 stone one when I went to the event. Yeah. Then the event, and then the fight, and then after the fight. And an hour after the fight. Now I was drinking and eating after the fight to get some, because I was dehydrated. Yeah. Wasn't hurt, wasn't really beat up or bruised. Went back to the hotel after the drug test. I was munching on bananas and whatever was left, drinks and fluids, whatever was left in the place. Smiling to myself that, yeah, I think I gave him a run for his money. Yeah, and the first thing I asked Steve after the fight was, can we have a rematch? <laughs> he said, not a prayer. <laughs> I thought, fair enough, and I moved on. And then um, I went to the hotel and I weighed myself, and I was 10 stone 
seven pounds. Wow. I've not been that weight since I was 17. Wow. You lost that much weight. And I learned, I learned, what I learned from that fight was I'd starved myself so much for each fight that I could no longer met the weight. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I could eat and be active and eat what I wanted, my body went down through the weight. At one point, Brendan said to me, you do realize you're boxing at 12 stone, don't you? I goes, yeah, because you're, you're, you're almost middleweight. I goes, I know. I'm eating everything I can eat. I can't eat anymore. <laughs> I never had that experience going into a fight before. So another reason why I seemed pretty strong in the fight, because I wasn't drained. Yeah. But saying that, I still wasn't 12 round fit. You need three months minimum for that. Mm. Well, it's an amazing achievement, um, you know, in and of itself, especially with the preparations uh, or, or lack thereof, um, you know, that was that was given to you. Um, oh, I tell you what, the dodgy dealings in boxing are just something else. And, it, it, you know, it, it is the way it is, yeah. You but know, but I love the sport and I love the experience of it. I never got damaged in the in the game of boxing. Um, mm -hmm. I say that. I mean, I never. I see too many fighters getting hurt in this game. That's why the philosophy I teach people is. You're not designed to take a punch. I tell fighters to come and train with me. Um, mm. Right, you know you can't take a punch, don't you? And they all go, <gasps> like I've just shocked them. I go, listen to me. You cannot take a punch. You are not designed to take a punch. Mm. You're soft tissue. You're made of soft tissue. If you get hit too many times, you will not remember your name yeah. or your family or what day it is. Understand that. No money in the world can help you here. Mm. I spoke to Muhammad Ali and I sat there and spent 20 minutes with him when he, when he had his book, Life of Times with Muhammad Ali by Thomas House. And he gave me 20 minutes of his time and he educated me in that moment there because I was going along the roads of, I was going to risk my life trying to win these titles. And something, the conversation he told me, um, we leave that to another day if you want, but it, it, it passed the knowledge on to me that you'll be the way you'll be and the way you train you train within yourself in whatever situation you're in and, and, and it's hard to explain but a lot of fighters think they can take a punch mm. and i say to you that's garbage it's garbage um your conditioning allows you to take a better punch your preparation allows you to take a better, better punch and your ability to perform skills will allow you to take a better punch any courage comes into this you cannot just take blows off full-blooded world-class fighters. Not even world-class fighters. There's guys walking around who don't even box who can hit hard. Probably yeah. hit as hard as Mike Tyson. Yeah. yeah. Well, they've got no skill level, but they know how to throw one single shot. Probably as hard as a, a professional fighter, a licensed fighter. And I say to people, we're not designed to be here. Mike Tyson's not designed to be here. Yeah. If you can continue to hit somebody, you will break them down. The skill is they don't get hit. And they minimize that. Mm. And a better skill with the money is you have better fighters coming in who can't really get to you anyway. <laughs> yeah. So it's the truth, you know what I mean? It is, it is the truth. And talking about the talking about your, your philosophy itself and going going into that, because this will be the have to be the last thing I think because of you know both of our, our times and, and you've got to get to your um your appointment a bit sharpish but just to give it a give it a mention here because obviously it is amazing work that you're doing when i was researching for this interview um i knew a little bit about the neville brown philosophy i knew a little bit about smart to box and and, and and bits and pieces but when i was researching for this you know piecing it all together there was also stuff online about you being uh, like a like a conflict uh, mentor or, or something that was mentioned. I'm not sure if that's current conflict or yeah. management probe, yeah. You know, yeah, and, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your current your current ventures, um, you know, that you're working on at the moment and you know, your future plans with those as well, you know, as what's happening. And that that'll have to be our last um, our last yeah, thing. But I think it's a nice point to, to wrap it up on is your you know, your current well, life and the good work you're doing. Well it works like this. I've been a boxer, been a sportsman all my life. That's all I know. You could say we're childish as sports people. We're, we're, we're mardy, we're, we're selfish, we're moody. We don't like losing. But there's more to us than that. But what I notice is all sport is important for all our children. Children, everybody. Okay, if you're 70 years of age, you need to be active. 
the, the thing about it is, is we don't need to be barbaric. We don't need to run 10 miles every day. We don't need to run at speeds we can't do. We don't need to cut our foods down while we're training. We're not, we're harming the body in so many ways. Now, as a boxer, boxing and football and all the things can help anybody, youngsters especially. The amount of champions I have, when I say champions, okay, they don't hold a schoolboy title. Some have done. They don't hold the ABA title. They don't hold a world title. Yeah? What their champion is, they are a champion in their own right. They know how to bring their best A game to, to the table. So I work on their philosophy, I work on the mindset, I work on, I do, I go into groups, I do group sessions, I do group. But I've got a lot of people, the, the design program I designed it for was for fighters, for boxers. So they, they could replicate their finest performances and abilities and know how to train and know how to eat, and which is not being taught to a lot of fighters. I'm assuming the top fighters have got it, but I wouldn't be surprised. So I don't see them doing some of these fundamental things they need to be doing in the art of boxing. The homeostasis is out of whack, losing weight, how they're losing weight, and so on. And why you're fat and why fat is so important and how it's been ridiculed for the years I've known. <laughs> yeah, and only now we're realizing how important it is. So I've got a program I design. Um, uh, uh, NB Promotions, Never Bounce Philosophy. Uh, Smart to Box is all about cognitive behavior, training, how we train, how we protect the gray matter, how we protect the body, how we get the body ready for impact. So now get back to the conflict side of it. Because you're taking up boxing as a sport, people think we just hit each other. It's a fight. We've got to get rid of the word fight. AJ's fighting at the weekend with Deontay Ward, whatever. Everybody processes that as a fight. What does fight actually mean? Fight means out of control. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that whoever is in the ring, AJ, whoever, is totally not out of control. He knows exactly what he's doing. That's an art. He knows exactly how he feels in the third round. He knows exactly how the fight goes when it's going well or not going well. He has to know these things. That's a fighter in control. So the idea of a fight, the word means out of control. So let's, that's physical, you understand that? We're in a ring, I'm swapping punches with you, you're swapping, we're having a fight. The media says that, they're having a fight. No, they're not, there's an art here. I hit you, not be here. Mm. Even if I'm in your face and come into your space, I'm still not fighting. I'm taking you apart with a jab. I'm taking you apart with a lead hook. I'm taking you apart with a combination. I'm going to overwhelm you in situations. I'm going to put you under pressure in different ways. ways yeah? I could be fighting with you, but I, I could be aggressive without even throwing a punch. If I step into your personal space, I'm aggressive, but I haven't touched you yet. Mm -hmm. You've allowed me into your personal space. So in boxing terms, you don't want that. So let's take the word back to fight to kids. I see kids, I see adults, I see people lacking confidence in situations. Sport teaches how to win, how to lose. But, but the big one is this. If you are struggling with linguistics, if you are struggling with numbers, if you are struggling with confidence, weight, under, over, gender, if you are struggling with these areas, guess what you're doing? You're in a fight. When I walk into a room, I was in a fight. As a young kid, being the only black kid in the school sometimes, or in a class, I was in a fight that I didn't even know because I was different. And the word I use is I was, um, I felt like an outcast. I got called outcast for years. I didn't understand why my mom would call me outcast, my dad would call me black. I felt like I was none of these. Blacks, you know, blacks, black. You know, I'm brown. Shouldn't, shouldn't white and black make grey? As a youngster, you know. But the the reality is, I felt like an outcast. That made sense when I finally found what that word meant. It was in a slave book. I read this slave book, and the person said they're outcast. They're outcast. They are not wanted. So once you become power or powerless to your own fears, I'm scared of numbers. I'm scared of of my, of my looks and not the right way. You're in a fight. Every day you wake up out of your room, out of your bed, 
you are in the same fight as yesterday. If you don't change those, those conditionings, those habits that now are so reinforced by TV, by media, by you name it. When you go into a restaurant, not a restaurant so much, when you go into the, uh, an as I shouldn't say names, when you go into a shopping place, you're being attacked by bright colored foods. All the foods at the children's level, eye level. Mothers are fighting off kids trying to leave the sweets alone, leave the chocolates alone. Every day we're being bombarded by um, things that are going to break us down. Food we're eating today is now becoming food-like substance. It's no longer food. Mm. The last two years should let us know about our health. Yeah? Mm. We are not looking after ourselves. We are living in such a bubble. The only person we have to worry about now is not a bear, not a wolf, not a snake, not a spider, but another human being. We do not have the personal skills to deal with another human being. So the boxing, the fight, we teach people how to honor themselves and respect themselves. And yes, it isn't just for boxers. The smart to box is just an app, boxing is a vehicle, but in time they will learn about themselves. Yeah, it's still early days because I've got to learn how to do all the new internet stuff and all this. I'm so I'm lost in that world. And that's a fight for me. <laughs> trying to keyboard this. I need people to do it, but it needs money for people to come and understand what we're doing. But hopefully I've explained what no brand promotion uh, for the, the the psychology needed. Everybody's fighting something, but we have to know where our, our best steps are, where our best direction is to be respecting ourselves and it's always changing it's never the same it's never constant the battle is to the day we take our last breath mm. it's a fight and it's enjoying the fight you know where to be in the fight to get the victory if that makes sense yeah makes total sense and it's, it's a really good i love it i mean everything you said there is fantastic i really think it's it's much needed um in in the world today you know i really think there's a big um sort of a gap there, if you like, for quite a few things that you've mentioned in people's understanding. So it's wonderful to um, to give that a shout out and the continued work you're doing now, even though we've just touched on it and I know it, it runs very deep. I know for both of our, our uh, schedules, you know, you need to, uh, you need to well, shoot yeah. off and so do I. I'd just like to say a big thank you for your time and I'd just like to say that it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. I'd love to have more of a chat, but I know you've got to go on and I've got to go as well. So I hope it goes well tonight. Enjoy it. And uh, thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Have a good day, you guys. Take care. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.